How many of you know how to swim? And now, how many of you learned when you were a child? Ah. Well, it is easier to learn to swim as a child because one of the first things that you need to learn is to how to let your head go under the water. And you know, this is, for some reason, easier for kids than it is for adults. I think for adults, I think we know too much. You know, and I think we do all that we can to keep our head above water, right? But if you're teaching an adult to swim, the first thing you have to do is overcome a lot of fear in order to help them really embrace the water. Letting go is the first step to learning how to swim. Now, I love to swim. I learned as a, at a very young age. I was fondly remember my swimming lessons at the, every summer at the public pools in Watertown, New York. I eventually, you know, swam on the swim team in high school. It was my one athletic endeavor in school. Go Cyclones. <laughs> and then in college, I learned how to teach people how to swim. I got my certification in water safety instruction, WSI. And as I started, you know, teaching people how to swim, I learned that one of the most challenging things for people to learn is how to float on their backs. But at the pool where I was teaching, that was an essential skill that you needed to master in order to be allowed to swim in the deep end. You had to be able to float on your back for a certain period of time. Now, I think the reason why it's hard to learn how to do this, to float on your back, is that you really have to relax in order to do it. Now, some of us have more natural flotation than others. <laughs> but no matter who you are, it, it makes you nervous to lie there on your back, relax your legs, relax your arms, and just float. Because you need to let go of your survival instincts. Those instincts that tell you to, to kick and to paddle. But you gotta arch your back, and then you need to let the water surround your face and just float. And when you actually master that, it can become such a relaxing thing to do. Well, my friends, this is the message of the gospel story today. Sometimes you need to let go of the things you want to hold on to the tightest in order to get closer to God. You heard the story. Jesus is walking along. This man runs up. He jumps ahead of him. He kneels before him, and he says, Good teacher, what must I do to, earn, to inherit eternal life? And at first, I think Jesus sounds a little distracted. He says, Well, you know the laws and the commandments. Go follow them. Kind of brushes the guy off. But then the man says, but I do, and I have, since I was very young. And then Jesus stops, and he looks at the man. And I imagine him, he looks him up and down. I mean, he really takes a measure of him. And Mark writes, Jesus, looking at him, loved him. And then Jesus says, oh, oh, you lack one thing. Sell what you own, give all the money to the poor, that is how you'll find treasure in heaven. And after you do that, come, come and follow me. Well, the man was shocked. Sell all that I own? Give my money away to the poor? What is he talking about? And we are told that the man went away grieving because he had many possessions. Well, I think it's safe to say that this exchange did not go the way the man thought it would. Can you imagine what it took for him to approach Jesus this way? Now, I imagine he was a good man. He was doing all that he could to follow the law and live a righteous life. And he had achieved some wealth. And in the culture of that time, wealth was considered a blessing from God. But Jesus tells him, sell everything, 
give the money to the poor. This Jesus is tough. And he seems to catch on that his disciples are surprised by what he says too. Because Jesus says twice to them, it is hard to enter the kingdom of God. And it is especially hard for wealthy people to attain eternal life. Jesus says, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for someone who is rich to enter the kingdom of God. Well, you know, everyone is shocked by this. How could this be so? And so finally his followers say, well then, who can be saved? And that's the aha moment. Jesus says, oh, you are finally getting it. There is nothing that you can do to earn salvation. Only God can do that. Now Jesus speaks in such radical extremes here because he wants to send the message. Mortals can't do anything to inherit the heavenly kingdom. Inheritance is not something that you can earn. An inheritance is a gift. It's not something we can control or should try to, even though some of us might try. So then is Jesus saying, don't do anything? Don't worry about good works? No. No, I don't think so. I think Jesus is speaking to this rich man. And he's using these radical terms because he sees the man's weakness. Jesus looks at the man and he loves him. So rather than condemning him for his sin, he confronts him with his weakness. His captivity to possessions is what is preventing him from living the full life of the kingdom. Now we can relate to that, can't we? I mean, how many times are we worried about what we have rather than what kind of people we want to be? So Jesus names the power that is holding this man captive, and he invites the man into freedom. And he speaks these sharp words out of love because he wants this man to be free. Now, Mark writes that the man went away grieving because he had many possessions. But maybe, maybe the man was grieving because he finally realized what he needed to do. And he knew that was going to be hard. New life in the kingdom of God requires new behavior. New behavior requires first steps. So maybe we shouldn't give away all that we have all at once. Maybe we can establish a new behavior of giving away just a little bit at a time. But life in the kingdom is about caring and sharing, and it can't be business as usual. So taking a first step is often difficult and can even be painful. Calling the marriage counselor, going to that first AA meeting, talking with a son or daughter about suspected drug use, coming out to your parents or your friends, or even giving away your money so you won't worry that you won't have enough. We have begun our annual stewardship program and I want to share the good news with you that giving away your money leads to freedom. Oh, I see some doubtful faces. But it is liberating. Some people say give until it hurts. I say give until it feels good. Now the paradox that we don't often talk about when we talk about money is that the more we practice giving it away, the less we worry about having enough. That's the paradox. And I know from firsthand experience, when Sally and I first started giving to the church, you know, we'd drop a $10 or a $20 bill into the basket. 
But when we started having our family and we decided we really wanted to commit to going to church every Sunday, well, we started to write a check when we'd write out our, our pay our bills each month. And then one year, the rector of the parish where we were attending did a teaching about proportional giving. And that made a huge impact on us. Proportional giving is intentionally giving a percentage of your income away to charity. Now, Jesus told the rich man that he had to sell everything and give it all away. That would be 100%. That is a pretty radical ask. Now, the goal that is taught typically in Scripture is 10%, the tithe. You look at your annual income, you move the decimal point over one number, and that is the goal of what you should be giving away. So when Sally and I first sat down to look at our finances and look at our numbers, we were surprised and a little embarrassed to notice that it was less than a half of a percent that we were giving away to charity. And we also noticed that we spent more money on cable television than we did give to the church. Now we really loved that church. This is the church community that raised me up as a leader. We really wanted our giving to match our values, but we were afraid that we wouldn't have enough. We'd recently bought our first house, we had a mortgage, two children, but we took a first step. We raised our pledge that year to 1%. We doubled our pledge. Well, by the end of the year, we looked back and we didn't miss any of that money. We didn't even notice it, really. So the next year, we decided to double it again, and we doubled it to 2%. Now we're rolling, right? End of the year, same thing. We didn't notice it. And the more we gave, the less we worried about having enough. That's the paradox. And it's hard to believe unless you've actually experienced it yourself. But we took that leap of faith to increase our giving because that church community meant a lot to us. And I think this also ties in to the message that Jesus offers today. Even though he used some pretty extreme words to get that rich man's attention, he still said to him, do what I'm telling you to do, but then come back and follow me. Personal transformation begins when we follow Christ. Kingdom behavior grows when we know the presence of God in our lives and we accept the identity as a Christian. Jesus says, come and follow me. Identifying with Jesus signifies a change in our character. It is not only a slow process, it is also a relational process. Being nestled and nurtured here in this faith community enables us to take those first steps into new behavior. Here, we are learning to let go and rise to a higher place. This is our metaphorical spiritual swimming pool and Christ is inviting us into the deep end. Here we are learning to take deliberate first steps that will help us let go of our earthly concerns and change us into kingdom-seeking people. With God, radical transformation is possible and is already happening. Jesus puts it plainly. You need, you need to let go of earthly things in order to find the heavenly things. May it be so. Amen.